Hey everybody, uh, this is the first part of your lecture on chemistry. Um, this is referring to chapter two of any anatomy and physiology textbook that you're going to find. Uh, I've given you a few learning objectives. Um, yes, there are a lot of uh, different things um, that you could learn with chemistry, but these are really what I want you to focus on for anatomy and physiology. Um, in particular, this video is going to walk you through the first three learning objectives, and the remainder is essentially biochemistry, and that will be on the next video. So uh, why are we talking about chemistry in the first place? I thought this was anatomy and physiology, right? I thought we were going to be talking about the heart. Well, uh, as we discussed in our first lesson, cells um, essentially contain molecules and cells work together to create tissues, which work together to create organs, which work together to create organ systems, and finally, us. And so in order to understand what is going on in us as an individual, um, we need to understand the cells themselves. And so cells in particular are chemical factories. Um, and these chemical factories are really the site of all of the chemical reactions in our bodies that constitute our metabolism. And so there's a lot of give and take um, to these processes. Right? And so just to uh, give you a very basic uh, summary here. Um, substances are absorbed into our cells and usually these substances um, are ultimately derived from molecules that we ingest as food, chop up via the digestive process, absorb into our blood and finally circulate around our body, feeding each of our cells in even far off parts of our body with exactly what they need. Now usually these substances um, are going to be modified in some way to meet the needs of the cell and ultimately the body. Um, so these substances are absorbed, um, kind of played around with, with different types of chemical reactions, right? Either they are broken and en energy is released to fuel different processes, or they are um, kind of put together, right? To ultimately build up some kind of human structure, um, etc. Right, so these chemical reactions um, involve the transfer of energy um, and use of this energy and ultimately use of the molecules themselves, um, which physically give rise to the essential activities that are occurring within our cells and our bodies. Right, so they can maintain and repair existing tissues. We can grow, that is, we can um, undergo cell division, replacing some tissue that might have been damaged or um, getting larger in general, um, and then even some special functions, right? So uh, generating some kind of an electrical signal to communicate a message from the brain down to our arm muscles, for example, so that we can move our arms to write down these notes. Okay, and so um, to understand all of these many things, um, we of course have to remember um, that molecules, Right, are multiple atoms that are joined together with particular types of bonds, which we'll review here in a moment. Um, multiple uh, molecules can interact with each other in such a way um, that they form different products. And so here, um, hydrogen gas and oxygen are the reactants and the products um, are H2O. Um, we can talk about different types of atoms of different elements um, by looking at the periodic table. Um, now, as you can see um, down here, we are not going to be focusing on the entire periodic table in this class. Um, all of this middle stuff in here um, is important in your uh, general chemistry classes, but for our purposes, we really just like the top two corners. Um, so maybe that's good news for us all. Um, but just as a reminder, um, each element um, has um, a symbol, so this combination of uh, one or two letters um, that ultimately determines what it is. Um, there's also what is called an atomic number. Um, if you remember, this is um, referring to how many protons the atom actually has. And so this number never varies. We can change the number of electrons, we can change the number of neutrons, we can never change the number of positively charged subatomic particles, which are the protons. Okay, so lithium here has three protons, three positively charged particles. Okay, the atomic mass um, is important in telling us um, essentially the average of all of the atomic or all of the masses of any isotope of lithium. 
um, you can see that this is the number that is not only larger than the atomic number, but also is not a whole number. And so, um, again, this is an average, and so this is um, indicating the fact that um, lithium has multiple variants, multiple isotopes. That is, um, some atoms have uh, three uh, neutrons and some atoms have four neutrons, um, etc. Okay, and so those um, neutrons are not going to be the focus of our talk. Um, generally, um, changing the number of neutrons does not change the chemical reactivity of an atom, um, but it can do some kind of cool things like um, allow us to trace atoms uh, through a body, and therefore we can do a lot of cool like testing um, techniques with isotopes. Uh, but again, um, we're not really focused on isotopes. We instead are focused um, on what is a lot more important um, to life on a day-to-day -day basis, and that is varying the number of electrons. Now, the atomic mass does not consider electron mass because they're just so tiny that their mass is negligible, um, but we will look at electrons instead. And so, um, as you most likely remember from your introductory chemistry classes, um, an atom, right, that is um, a non-charged uh, substance is or has an equal number of protons and neutrons, so equal positive and negative. Um, and so lithium has three protons always. A lithium atom would therefore have three electrons as well. And so these electrons are um, sometimes mapped in what is called a Bohr model, which is what we see here on the screen. Um, essentially, um, if you were to um, take a snapshot in time, most likely the electrons would be orbiting around the, nu the nucleus of protons and neutrons within what are called energy shells or electron shells or energy levels, right? Lots and lots of different names for the same thing. Um, you'll hear me say this all the time, but why name something once if you can't name it two or three times? This happens all the time in anatomy. And so, um, again, Electrons um, are generally found in this area, these shells um, around the nucleus. Um, in the first electron shell, there are up to two electrons. In the next electron shell, there are up to eight electrons. In the next energy shell, there are up to eight electrons. And beyond that, we aren't really concerned about. All right, so two, eight, and eight. Okay, so this is a lithium atom, we can see two electrons in the first shell and the remaining of three electrons in the second energy shell. And so this, of course, is the entire periodic table. Of all of the elements that we can see here, there are six that are by far the most common in the human body or any, um, uh, any living thing on Earth. All right, so these four in particular are most common. Um, we have carbon, might imagine. Hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, um, and again those are the four most common, but phosphorus and sulfur are also very important to life as well. And so really what makes these elements so much more common than everything else? Um, and so before we get to that I do want to show you this table um, which just very briefly summarizes um, where these different elements are. Um, so of course um, you know, carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, as we'll see soon here, um, they make up organic molecules, and so our bodies are literally built out of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. All right, you will not have to reproduce um, these abundances or functions or anything um, on a test. I just thought it would be good uh, for you guys to see. Okay. So again, what makes these elements so much more common than the rest of the entire periodic table? And the answer to that is that some of these elements, right, particularly those in the top corners, um, are very reactive with other similar elements. Um, and so um, to discuss the reactivity, um, we should recall that the outermost shell, right, whether it's the first, second, third, fourth, whatever, um, electron shell is called the valence shell. And so however many electrons are in that valence shell, those are called valence electrons. Um, and so the most stable configuration, 
right? So when the atom is um, to anthropomorphize uh, comfortable and not really um, prone to interacting with other things is when there is a full valence shell, whether it's two electrons or eight electrons or so on and so forth. Okay, so the most stable configuration is with a full valence shell. And so um, you probably remember that this column over here contains the noble gases. Um, helium has two electrons in its valence shell, the rest have eight in their valence shell, and so these guys aren't going to react with anything. They are comfortable just the way that they are. Um, they are most stable. Um, however, everything else um, is either a couple electrons short of a full valence shell or a few electrons um, away or yeah, from, from having a full valence shell. Um, and so um, even if these elements don't initially have um, a full valence shell, they can actually interact with other uh, elements, other atoms, um, in order to fulfill what we can call the octet rule. All right, so most stable configuration, a full valence shell, the octet rule says that we need eight electrons or two all right, for uh, hydrogen or helium in order to fulfill this most st stable rule. Um, and so how exactly do atoms achieve this stability? Well, they form bonds, right? So we've surely all heard of covalent and ionic bonds. Um, for our purposes, it really is this simple. Covalent bonds are sharing electrons and ionic bonds are unshared electrons. So donating and accepting of electrons, right? So that is uh, what is important for our purposes. Um, what is also important, um, and we'll look at these in a little bit more in just a second here, but um, not all chemical bonds are created equally. Um, first of all, important to living organisms is the strength of these bonds varies quite considerably. In general, covalent bonds are by far the strongest of these type, different types of interactions. Um, so when you're sharing electrons, you're much more likely to stay together. Um, then if you donate or accept electrons. Um, hydrogen bonds, um, which are also important to living things, um, hydrogen bonds are even weaker even than ionic, um, and nonpolar interactions. Okay, um, so let's just talk a little tiny bit more about ionic bonds. Um, I have included up here um, the region of the periodic table that we care about in this class. Um, ionic bonds um, occur between atoms that either donate or accept electrons, right? So generally, um, an ionic bond is going to occur in atoms that have maybe one more electron than, um, like one or two electrons in their valence shell, or are missing one, two, maybe three electrons in their valence shell. Okay, um, so these are the elements that are most likely to uh, have ionic bonds. All right, so let's talk about an example here. Um, sodium chloride, right, common old table salt. Um, sodium and chlorine, all right, take a look up here. Sodium has atomic number 11, which means that in its atom form, it's also going to have 11 electrons. Okay, so let's uh, draw a Bohr model first, right, in the first orbital, the first electron shell, there are always going to be two electrons. So two out of these 11 electrons are going to be orbiting in this first electron shell. Right, I'm just drawing little dashes. Um, anywhere in this shell, um, there is certainly like the ideal placing of these uh, of these electrons um, if we were to make a completely accurate Bohr model. Um, however, for our purposes, as long as you have the right number of electrons in these shells, that is good enough for me. Okay, so two of the 11 electrons are going to go in the first orbital, leaving us nine. Um, so the second orbital um, always has eight electrons. So we'll have eight. All right, um, and again, I don't really care where these are as long as you have the right number, all right? And so um, that leaves us with one electron left. Um, this electron is 
the only one in the valence shell, and so this is a very unstable configuration. Right? To fulfill the octet rule, we need eight, but we only have one. Right? So let's talk about chlorine for a second. Right? Chlorine is atomic number 17, so chlorine atom has 17 electrons. Right? As always, there are two electrons in the valence shell, so one and two. Right? Um, leaving us 15. Right? Again, we do another eight in the next valence shell. Right, and so 15 minus 8 is going to be 7. And so in the valence shell, in the outermost electron shell, we are going to have 7 electrons. Right, so 2, 4, 6, and 7. And so there should be one more electron in order for, to fulfill the octet rule. Right? This is not stable. Okay, so um, what happens, of course, is that sodium is going to donate its electron to chlorine. And so this does two things. First of all, it creates an imbalance of electrons, of electrons to protons in both sodium and chlorine. Sodium still has 11 protons. It always has 11 protons that never changes, but now it has just gotten rid of one of its electrons. And so now it has one more proton than it does electron. And so it is going to have a positive charge or it is now a cation. Okay, chlorine on the other hand, um, still has 17 protons. It always has 17 protons, but now it has gained an extra electron. So it has 18 electrons, 17 protons. And so it has a net charge of negative one. Okay, so chlorine is the anion, sodium is the cation. Okay, and um, just like with people or anything, right, opposites attract, right? So the positive and the negative ions, the cation, sodium, the anion, chlorine, are going to be attracted to each other because they have this opposite charge. And so, just to reiterate here, ionic bonds are formed between ions, right? Ions are simply charged particles, cations, the sodium, chlorine, the anion is negatively charged because of this donating and receiving of an extra electron. And so, the ion bond itself is literally just an attraction between ions. Covalent bonds, on the other hand, are much stronger. Covalent bonds involve atoms actually sharing electrons, meaning that sometimes electrons are around the one atom and sometimes they're around the other atom. And beyond that, not only can they share a pair of electrons, they can share multiple pairs of electrons, right? Forming a double bond or even the triple bond. And so the more covalent bonds there are, the stronger the interaction is going to be. And so let's talk about methane. Right, CH4, C for carbon, H4 for four hydrogen atoms. All right, take a look up here. Carbon is atomic number six, right, which means that two electrons, as always, are going to go in the first electron shell and four are going to be placed in the valence shell. Okay, and so um, we'll see here shortly how this four electron in the valence shell um, is actually critically important to the formation of organic molecules. Right, so we'll get there. Um, but for now, let's talk about methane, CH4. Um, H, hydrogen, has one single lonely electron uh, that it is going to share with carbon. Right, so this here is showing us overlapping orbitals, uh, essentially. Um, each of these electrons is going to spend a little bit of time around hydrogen and then, of course, orbit around carbon as well. Okay, um, And so uh, CH4, right, there's still four more openings for hydrogens, and so that's going to be the case. Right, here's a second hydrogen, a third, and a fourth. And so carbon is now sharing its four valence electrons with the valence electrons of four hydrogen atoms. Okay, we'll come back to this. Don't forget about this. Um, covalent bonds, um, so this sharing of electrons, this overlapping of the orbitals here, um, 
can be portrayed in a lot of different ways. And so if you've taken organic chemistry, I'm sure you uh, have, a bun have a bunch <laughs> of uh, different uh, methods that you can bring to mind right away. But um, for our purposes, all I want to point out is that um, covalent bonds are often portrayed simply as a line. All right, so this line is a sharing of a single pair of electrons. If there were two lines there, that would be sharing of two pairs of electrons. Um, also, um, here's another way of portraying this molecule. Um, this essentially is showing you a hydrogen that is kind of coming out of the screen at you, and this hydrogen is kind of going back into the screen at you. Um, and so this helps us to see that the carbon is actually surrounded on all sides in three-dimensional space by these hydrogens, and that is going to become very important here in just a second. Okay, um, so it is important for us to understand that these hydrogens are surrounding carbon on all sides because that means that these hydrogens are equally sharing the electrons with carbon. All right, so to understand that, let us first take a look at a molecule that does not share its electrons equally. And that molecule is H2O, right? So H2, one hydrogen, two hydrogens, and an oxygen uh, sharing a pair of electrons with each. Okay, and so um, what we can see in the water molecule is that the hydrogens are on one side of the molecule. Um, as opposed to in methane, the hydrogens are on all sides of the molecule. Okay, um, and so we can look at this um, in yet another uh, portrayal of molecules. Um, carbon is surrounded on all sides by hydrogen here, and here oxygen in red is on one side of the molecule where the hydrogens are on the other side of the molecule. Right? And so if each of these electrons is spending some time around one atom and some time around the other atom, right, um, we can see that um, hydrogen, which is super tiny compared to oxygen, much larger, is going to have each electron for a much shorter stay. Right? So a little bit of time and then it has to rotate all the way around this oxygen over here. And so um, the electrons actually spend a lot more time around the oxygen than they do the hydrogen, meaning that at any particular moment in time, the oxygen has more electrons than it has protons. All right, so the electrons are going to be over there more than they're going to be on the hydrogen side. And again, at any particular moment, take a snapshot in time, this hydrogen isn't going to have any electron around it because both of these are too busy orbiting around the oxygen. All right, so what this does is it creates, um, again, an unequal sharing of electrons. Right? There are usually more electrons on this side of the molecule than they are on this side of the molecule, as opposed to methane, where um, there's always you know, kind of a similar charge, similar distribution because of the arrangement of these hydrogens around the carbon. Okay, and so um, this is very important for humans because nonpolar covalent bonds um, are formed in molecules that don't interact well with water. Right, we'll talk about that more here in just a moment. Um, but methane is an example of nonpolar covalent bonds. Um, Polar covalent bonds, on the other hand, are unequal sharing of electrons, which means that there are kind of polar opposites, right? There are opposite charges on one side of the molecule relative to the other side of the molecule. And it's even this slight charge, not a full charge, but a slight charge, which is going to completely change the behavior of the molecules. Okay, and just to reiterate, polar covalent bonds are in a water molecule, and that is going to be very important to a human, uh, to any life on Earth. Okay. Um, I also want to point out that this symbol right here uh, means slightly positive, and this symbol right here means slightly negative. You might see that in your studying efforts. Which leads us to hydrogen bonds. Okay, so um, what we can see up here in the image um, is a bunch of water molecules together, right? The hydrogen side is slightly positive, the oxygen slide side is slightly negative. And so just like we saw with ionic bonds, opposites attract. Right? So the slightly positive side of one ox or one hydro one water molecule 
is attracted to the slightly positive side of the neighboring water molecule. Okay, um, and so what this does is it creates, um, yes, a weaker interaction than you would even see in ionic bonds, but um, when you have a lot of these bonds together, it actually creates um, a fairly strong interaction. All right, so we don't, need, we don't see this just between water molecules, although we'll focus on that. Um, we also see hydrogen bonds um, facilitating the structure of a lot of other biomolecules that are critically important to our existence. For example, DNA. Okay, so as we can see down here, here's the standard image of double helical DNA. Um, on each one of these strands of DNA is your genetic code, right? So a combination of A's, G's, C's, and T's that essentially are the blueprint for forming the proteins and other molecules in your body. Um, and so uh, every time we want to make a protein, right? So every time we drink a glass of milk and we want to digest that lactose, uh, that milk sugar, we need to make a lactase enzyme. And so in order to do that, we need to literally unzip the genes, we need to break the bonds, holding these um, two strands of DNA together, read that blueprint and ultimately make a protein out of it. Now this would be really crummy if we had to put a lot of energy into splitting these two strands of DNA apart every time we wanted to drink a darn glass of milk. And so the bonds that hold the two strands together are actually hydrogen bonds, which means that um, the relatively weak, right? A relatively weak interaction. Um, so they're easy to break. They're easy to unzip the genes. In fact, um, the enzyme responsible for doing that just kind of like spins around real fast and it literally disturbs those bonds and breaks them. Okay. But um, on the other hand, when lots of these hydrogen bonds are put together, right? So two or three of these bonds for every single nucleotide in your genome um, exist. Um, to keep these strands together. And so DNA is a very stable molecule, even in its double helical form, because when lots of these are together, they're strong, but it's relatively easy to break individual bonds. Okay, hydrogen bonds um, also give rise to some of the major properties of water and what make water um, so perfect for life, right? So um, water molecules stick to each other and they stick to other molecules, right? So the process of, or um, the phenomenon of cohesion is when water molecules stick together, so essentially creating surface tension. Now we can see a little water strider over here. Um, he can walk on water um, easily because the water molecules are sticking together. Um, this is important for us, right? We don't walk on water or anything, but um, we have a film of water over our eyes and essentially um, there's a lot of surface tension which keeps things like dust and whatnot uh, from actually accessing our conjunctiva and later into our eye. It's so really important there. Um, on the other hand we have adhesion as well. Um, water molecules stick to other things that are charged, so other polar molecules as well. Um, and so I know this isn't relevant to um, specifically AMP, but it's kind of cool and it does work the same way in us as well. Um, but essentially, um, in order for um, trees to suck water up through the roots, um, what happens is that water evaporates or transpirates, um, sorry, transpires out of, um, out of the leaves. Um, and essentially, um, that loss of water from the leaves is going to suck up water kind of like a straw. And so how exactly does that work? How does the water not just like fall down against gravity once um, transpiration stops? Um, essentially, um, each of these little water molecules sticks to each other. So as one goes up, the next one is literally pulled up after it. So the same idea as a straw. Um, but what prevents them from falling back down again when um, the stomata little holes in the leaves close up is that um, the water molecules then stick to the side of the cell walls and the xylem cells. Um, so um, really important for humans, not just for water striders and for plants, water molecules stick to each other and they stick to other polar molecules. Um, hydrogen bonds, 
between these slightly charged ends of water molecules also give rise to the fact that water doesn't change temperature very easily. And that's a good thing for us. Uh, water, right, the hydrogen bonds um, between water molecules absorb a lot of heat without a great change in temperature. Okay, um, so what that means is that um, when you are developing in utero, right, so as a fetus, um, you are surrounded by amniotic fluid, and even if there are changes in temperature outside mom's body, the temperature inside the uterus is not going to change because uh, baby is surrounded by water. Okay, um, also, um, you know, here we see that the water is still um, unfrozen, whereas it's clearly below freezing outside. Um, so this, of course, helps um, to keep water from changing temperature drastically and therefore allows us um, to continue hunting fish and whatnot um, even during the winter months. Um, and of course, um, you know, from Stockton here, um, the temperature by the shore, right, so uh, in Atlantic City, even, you know, closer to Pomona, while we're stocked in is um, the temperature at the shore fluctuates much less because the ocean is kind of insulating us, right? So the ocean doesn't change temperature very quickly, which is why you can go swimming um, now and it's still so cold, uh, even though it's warm outside, the water holds its temperature really well. And of course that's important for us um, internally as well as um, logistically, right? Um, also, um, Water has a high heat of evaporation, and so we talked about this a little bit in our first lecture as well. Um, it takes a lot of energy, that is a lot of heat, in order to evaporate water, to actually break those hydrogen bonds between the water molecules. Of course, there are a lot of them. Right, so what this means is that um, when we really sweat onto the surface of our skin, um, every single water molecule that is able to evaporate, it pulls a lot of heat out of our body and therefore we can better thermoregulate because we're using water because of these properties of water again which are a product of the hydrogen bonds between those molecules water is a solvent for other polar substances as well right so other substances um, that have an unequal sharing of electrons Right, so water is a solvent, so something that dissolves a solute. Um, the solutes themselves um, must have either a full charge, right? so sodium, of course, is a cation. It has a full positive charge um, and is therefore attracted to the slightly negative sides of water um, or even just uh, molecules that have a slight charge um, anywhere on the molecule. So uh, these are polar molecules, right? they have a charge, um, and we can also call them hydrophilic. Right? So hydro for water, philic for love. So anything that has a charge or a slight charge loves water. Um, on the other hand, molecules that are nonpolar, such as methane that we talked about earlier in this lesson, um, there is an equal sharing of electrons on all sides of this molecule, therefore there's no charge. Therefore, there is no attraction between the slightly negative side of the molecule here um, or even the slightly positive side of the molecule over here. Um, and so this is where we get the whole oil and water thing, which we'll talk about more in our next lesson. Okay, um, as a preview to that next lesson, um, nonpolar molecules do not dissolve in water, right? So here we can see oil trying to mix with water, but ultimately it forms little droplets. Um, and the droplets are essentially um, decreasing the surface area exposed to that water, um, if at all possible. Okay, um, again, we'll talk about that more. Um, ionic compounds, all right, such as salts, sodium chloride, um, these ions actually dissociate from one another and they are surrounded by water molecules, therefore they dissolve freely within water. Um, and things like glucose have a slight charge, all right, so uh, slight positives and negatives around the molecules and therefore they can also interact with uh, water. All right, so you can dissolve your Kool-Aid mix into water um, because those are polar or hydrophilic molecules. Um, 
ionic compounds, right? so salt, sodium chloride, um, readily dissolve in water right? because of those ionic bonds, because of those charges. Um, salt gets a pretty bad reputation because of its implications in um, blood pressure regulation. Right? So too much of a good thing is obviously no longer good. Um, but we absolutely need salts in our diet. And I'm not talking about um, you need to have super salty pretzels and french fries and whatever. Um, you actually get a lot of salts um, in your regular food. I and mean, of course, if you're sweating a lot and excreting lots and lots of salt, which of course pulls lots and lots of water um, out of your sweat glands to help you uh, thermoregulate, um, you of course need to replace those salts. And so that's where uh, you get things like Gatorade, right? Why do things need electrolytes? Well, because you need these ions, right? So after uh, the salts uh, enter the fluids of your body, they dissociate into what are called electrolytes. Um, and we absolutely need these uh, for contracting our muscles, for pumping our blood, for sending electrical signals within our brain and to the rest of our body, right? We absolutely need these ions, right? So again, the salts are the ionic compounds, right? So uh, sodium chloride and whatnot, um, and then the electrolytes are um, able to dissociate from that. Okay, and so another uh, other types of molecules that also readily dissociate um, in water are acids and bases, right? So we can usually refer to a fluid um, as having a particular pH, right? It is acidic or it is basic. Um, so these molecules, right, water and others, dissociate in water um, and they are able to conduct an electrical current. Um, so whenever we refer to the pH of something, um, we're usually referring to it um, on this scale from 1 to 14, um, with 7 being neutral. And right? so what the heck is the 7 actually referring to? Um, well, if you have a beaker of 100% pure water, right, so just H2O molecules, um, those water molecules don't actually stay the way they are all the time. They're actually always dissociating and reassociating. So when they dissociate, they essentially break off a hydrogen ion from a hydroxide ion, right? So water to hydrogen and hydroxide, and then back together again. And so at a neutral pH, a water, water in a beaker with 100% water molecules, there should be equal numbers of hydrogen and hydroxide ions. Okay, so um, when that is the case, it turns out that there are 10 to the minus seventh hydrogen ion moles per liter. So um, even though we don't usually units, use units when we talk about pH, um, it's actually referring to something real, something tangible. Okay, so 10 to the minus seventh. So in other words, um, point six zeros, right? One, two, three, four, five, and six zeros one hydrogen ions okay so that is neutral um, however when we add more hydrogen ions right so here's hydrochloric acid um, we are essentially disrupting this balance between hydrogen and hydroxide and so hydrogen ions are now more abundant than hydroxide. And so the pH number actually goes down. But what is that saying? That is now saying that this fluid has 10 to the minus two hydrogen ion moles per liter. So instead of 0.601, now it is 0.01. Right? So this is actually a much larger abundance of hydrogen than this number over here, okay, so that number. Okay, um, so again, acidic solutions have more hydrogen ions and a lower pH. Okay, on the other side of this uh, scale, um, we have the addition of more hydroxide ions or the removal of more hydrogen ions, depending. Um, and so uh, this, right? Uh, would be an alkaline or a basic solution, and this would be um, 10, or this would be 0 0.1201, right? So a much, much smaller number than neutral or acidic. So why do we care? Well, um, here is neutral. Um, we as humans interact with all sorts of things that are certainly not neutral. 
All right, so the coffee you are drinking right now um, is a little acidic. Um, your stomach is super acidic, right? But then eggs, slightly basic, right? Bleach, right? Interacting with that a lot these days um, is also pretty darn basic. Okay, right? so um, just a reminder, um, acids, um, are essentially adding hydrogen ions to a solution, right? So to your body, perhaps, if you're ingesting them. Um, we can call acids proton donors because they are donating protons, right? Hydrogen ions. Um, on the other hand, um, bases or alkaline solutions are essentially accepting protons, right? So this can either mean they are literally adding hydroxide ions um, to the solution, or of course they can actually bind hydrogen ions to this hydroxide, therefore removing hydrogen ions from the solution. Okay, and so, um, as I said, we interact with um, many different substances of wildly varying pHs all the time. Okay, um, and so it is critically important to be able to protect our body from these changes in pH, right? So usually um, our blood ranges from 7.35 to 7.45 pH. So 7.4, slightly basic, is what our blood normally is. Now, if we drink tomato juice, Right? Um, if we're drinking coffee, that is, of course, much lower than the normal pH of our body. Right? So what would happen if we didn't regulate our pH and we just became whatever pH that we were drinking? Right? We became a pH of 5 instead. Well, what would happen um, if we didn't protect ourselves against this is that all of those lovely hydrogen bonds that are maintaining structures for us. So this um, particular molecule is um, a protein, right, which might be an enzyme. It might be um, you know, a structural protein. Right? They are held together in three-dimensional shapes, just like DNA, with our friends, the hydrogen bonds. And so if we have all of a sudden way too many hydrogen ions, what that's going to do is it's going to break this bond and you're going to start having hydrogens bind here, right? So that is literally going to denature or unravel your proteins, um, which as you might imagine is game over pretty fast, right? So we put a lot of effort into uh, maintaining a pH of 7.4, okay? Um, if you have some feedback issue, right? Just like Paul Anderson said in our first lecture, um, if you have a feedback issue such that you start to become more acidic, so a pH below 7.35, um, literally your proteins will start to denature and you go into a coma. Um, and if this is not treated properly, um, you can die. Alkalosis, on the other hand, is when you become too alkaline Right, which is also a problem, right? Drinking alkaline water, um, A, isn't doing anything, and B, even if it was, um, being too alkaline is just as bad as being too acidic. Okay, um, all right, so alkalosis is being too, uh, too alkaline. Um, this usually results in uh, seizures, first and foremost. Okay, so how exactly do we make sure our pH stays at about 7.4, right? And of course, there's a little bit of a range. Um, negative feedback produces a little bit of fluctuation, but for the most part, we keep our blood at 7.4, whether you're drinking coffee or um, eating leafy greens, which are very basic. Um, chemical buffers are really your first line of defense against a shift in pH. Um, and so what these buffers do is they resist changes in pH by donating or accepting protons. And that terminology is critically important, right? The buffers are not trying to get your pH to seven, right? We don't want seven, seven is too acidic. We are trying to maintain pH at exactly where it needs to be, right? If you're talking about the stomach, you want a pH of like two. If you're talking about your blood, you want a pH of 7.4. Buffers are not trying to get the pH to seven, they are resisting changes. They are maintaining the pH that is ideal for that particular environment. Okay, um, and so in your blood, 
the first um, and certainly strongest of the chemical buffers um, is this carbonic acid bicarbonate system. Um, and as we can see here, um, this is a reversible reaction depending on what's going on in your body. Um, and so um, if you become too alkaline, right? So your pH is too high. You don't have enough hydrogen ions. What happens is that carbonic acid is going to release one of its hydrogen ions. So now we have one more hydrogen ion floating around in the blood, which is going to pull the pH down. Okay, on the other hand, um, if you become more acidic, which let's face it is more common in our society these days, um, if you become more acidic, um, what happens is that this molecule here, bicarbonate, can accept this hydrogen ion, right? therefore pulling it out of solution, therefore bringing the pH back up. Okay, so again, this is a reversible reaction. Um, if you're too alkaline, the reaction goes this way. If you are too acidic, the reaction goes this way. And then um, we can actually get rid of um, the hydrogen ions um, or save them um, with some cool techniques by our lungs and our kidneys. So stay tuned. That is an AMP2 topic. Um, so this um, is the end of today's lesson. Uh, part one, that is, uh, the second lesson is going to be on biochemistry.